Well, good morning. I, uh, man, I love that, that last song we sang, that, that gets to that bridge and just all heaven breaks loose right there, right? And it just goes nuts, and I love it. And so, uh, and uh, it's only slightly a little bit quieter than where I was last night. And so, uh, but, uh, but uh, how many, how many of y'all are morning folks? We got, we got morning folks, we got a few morning folks in here. And y'all, you, we all know the ones that aren't, they're like, Ugh. right? Um, I'm a, I'm a morning person. I usually wake up between the hours of 4:45 and 4:46. Um, <laughs> no, it's usually between 4:45 and 5:15 in the morning. I don't think I've set an alarm in uh, years. I don't even remember the last time I actually I've set one just in case, like because I'd be like, if I don't set it, it'd be the day that I would like miraculously sleep to like six, and uh, and so I, I set one just in case I have to get up early, which is I, I don't ever really have to get up, but um. But, but um, mornings to me are, are the best. But uh, here's the thing about us morning people, for, for, and you guys know this if you're not a morning person, we're a little weird. We're a little weird, you know? Um, and so we're kind of like, uh, y'all, y'all, have you ever been around a CrossFit person? Right? <laughs> like, they're a little bit weird about CrossFit. Well, morning people are a little bit weird about morning, about the morning time. It's just who we are. And, um, but here's the reason, I'll give you the reason why I, I kind of shifted my, my life uh, to uh, get up early, uh, about probably, uh, I would say, at least 10 years ago, I, I made a commitment that says, I'm going to get up early. Uh, it, it allows me to control the pace of my day, right? It allows me to get up and have a pot of coffee, uh, read a little bit. Notice I said pot, not cup. Uh, uh, it, it allows me to, to, to start my day at a leisurely pace. Uh, I'm never hurried in the mornings. I'm never, um, I, I don't ever hit snooze because there's no alarm to hit snooze on. Uh, and I think the reason why uh, most of us like Saturdays is because most Saturdays are not hurried. And even if they are hurried, there, there's still a little bit of that break. Well, it's a Saturday because I don't really have to be anywhere. I don't really have to do anything. I, nothing's really required of me. And so, um, and, and I think we like the weekends because we don't feel hurried. And the reason I shifted to, to make my lifestyle that way is because I don't want to be hurried. Because we live in a hurried world, don't we? We live in the hustle and the bustle of everything that's going on. And when we ask somebody how you're doing, right, we usually, the, the words are usually fine or they're, uh, I'm doing good. But many times they're what? Busy, right? How you doing? Oh, man, man, it busy. It's busy. I mean, can, can you relate? Can we relate to that? Right? And here's the thing. Like, we would even feel guilty if somebody's like, how's your week been? It's been great. I haven't done anything all week. Because you would feel like that person would look back at you and go, you lazy bum. Right? Right? Like, if somebody came up just like, were you on vacation? Nope. I just really didn't do anything this week. Just wasn't busy. Just, just sat on the couch, watch, you know, watch some football and golf and it's just, you know, like we use busy almost as a status symbol for our life. We use it as a status symbol. Uh, Joe Pinkster, who wrote an article called, Ugh, I'm So Busy, a status symbol for our time in the, in the um, I don't remember where it was now, I don't have it written down, the, the athletic, that's what it was. He, he said this, he said, in a curious reversal, aspirational objects are not luxury goods, but uh, like a nice watch or a new car, but instead of bragging about how busy you are. Wanting to seem busy is how one gains status in culture that values productivity and business above all else. We're busy. We wear it as a badge of honor. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, um, commonly known as the DSM-5, doesn't actually... Uh, classify this as a disorder, but it, they have it uh, defined uh, a hurry sickness. And I've talked about this before, um, but, but it says hurry sickness is this, is a behavioral pattern that involves a constant sense of urgent, urgency, rushing, and anxiety. People with hurry sickness may feel like they are always short on time and may become flustered when there are delays. Some of you are probably like self-diagnosing yourself right now as 
I've got something new to put on my thing. If you want to test yourself, uh, if you if you have hurry sickness, next time you go to the grocery store and it's busy, just pick the longest line. See, y'all are laughing because you're like, hey, why would you do that? Because we're in a hurry, right? Right. We're always got somewhere to go. We always have something to do. Um, and and um, you know, I think we finally we constantly find ourselves on the go. I don't know about you, but sometimes we, I like to multitask. And I'll get to the end of that, and I'll be like, what am I multitasking for or about? What am I trying to do? Because we're in such constant hurry. And what I want us to look at, we're in a series called Reclaim the Table. And we're talking about the ministry of Jesus uh, and how Christianity was started. It wasn't started behind pulpits or in buildings. It was started around tables at meals and in the gospel of luke that we're looking at jesus was either going to a meal he was at a meal he was leaving a meal or he was prepping a meal and so um and so we're, we're looking at this and what i want us to do today as the holidays approach i want us to look at maybe just possibly slowing down a little bit taking a breath being present in the midst of the chaos, because here's the thing, we can't get around the chaos of the holidays, can we? Like, there's things vying for our schedule, like there's there's parties, there's there's kids things you got to go do, there's there's this, there's that, and then, you know, throw on top of all the other stuff you got to already do, and you got to add all this, so so here's what I want to us to look at, and we're going to look at a story that is, might possibly be very familiar to many of us, um, is how do we, and how are we present because i think we can all agree that we've lost the ministry of what i call presence being in the midst of other people and being present when they are there we don't gather around tables uh, very often anymore but when we do many times we're still so distracted by all the things that have to get done that we miss actually being there be present i would probably contend with us um, it, many of us probably might just feel off sometimes because we're so busy. We really can't put our finger on why we feel off, but we, we know um, that, that we're just off. It doesn't feel right. You know, God created us as human beings to operate in certain patterns. And he ordered us to be present, and he ordered us to rest, right? Right? He ordered us to take a break, uh, to take portions of our week and literally take a break from life. And honestly, if we're honest, myself included, um, this is a sin. And you're like, it's a sin? Yes, it was in the Ten Commandments for us to take a Sabbath. Um, and, and what we need to understand, and we've talked on this before, a Sabbath is not what we're doing, right? The Sabbath is not coming to church, and it's, it's really technically... It, it can be, but, but technically it's, it's, it's a break from, from your normal activity. There is a logical God-designed order to life, and when we follow that design, our life just flat out goes better. Bottom line. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to look at um, a story where Jesus actually orders someone to slow down. He orders them to take a break. Uh, of what they're doing and to be present. So uh, kind of context for where we're at, Jesus' life is getting somewhat crazy at this moment, right? We saw last week his popularity was growing. Uh, he tried to get away from uh, with his disciples to like a, a secluded area in Bethsaida, and the people found him. And then they all got hungry, and he fed them. And, and so his popularity is growing. He's casting out demons. He's healing people. He's doing all these things. And so uh, so, so Jesus's life was busy, right? Like he was, people were demanding, uh, to be around Jesus. Uh, I mean, just think if, if there was someone in our town today that was here, that was known to turn water into wine and raise the dead, we would probably be there right now with him, right? We'd be like, I want to see this. So, so people were showing up wherever Jesus was, but occasionally what Jesus had to do was he had to retreat. He had to essentially call a timeout and say, I'm going to get away. I'm just going to go rest. I'm going to be with the Father. But many times when he got away, his retreat place was a place called Bethany. It's a town that still exists today, uh, just north of Jerusalem. 
And uh, he would go there to a friend's house uh, who had, the friend was Lazarus, uh, and he had two sisters named Mary and Martha. And that's what happens here in Luke chapter 10, and we'll pick it up in verse 38. He says, says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the feet, uh, at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Now, here's the thing. In culture, um, this was not normal, okay? Uh, it was women were not permitted to sit at the feet of, of the rabbi. They were not permitted usually to be in the same room uh, as, uh, as the men were when they were talking. Right, y'all, I know we think that's crazy, but it was just the culture of that day. Uh, and so don't, don't miss the significance of where Mary is in this moment, right? She is at the feet of Jesus, which is a big societal no-no. Like, I know we take that, that, that idea of sitting at the feet of Jesus and kind of make it nomenclature for who we are. And, but what she's, very, what she's doing in this moment is extremely inappropriate. And what does Jesus do, right? He doesn't tell her, excuse me, honey, you're not supposed to be in here, right? No, no, no. He lifts, he elevates her and dignifies her in who she is, which is what Jesus did regularly to women in ministry and out of ministry. Verse 40 says this, it says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Picture this, right? Martha's doing the appropriate, honorable thing. The thing that was expected of her to doing. She's doing what she's supposed to be doing. She's doing a good thing. And she comes in, and did you, did you catch how she addressed Jesus in the moment? Like, first off, she calls him Lord, right, which is what we should do. And then she sort of reprimands him. Did you, did you catch that? She kind of, like, Lord, like, you, really, you need to tell her. You need to tell her to get up and do what she's supposed to do. And I think we do this many times, don't we? Like we don't think we, we don't want to think we do this, but we say, "Lord, you really should be doing this," or or we even say, "Lord, why why aren't you doing this?" Verse forty one, Jesus' response back, he says, "Martha, Martha," the Lord answered, "You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed." Or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. So remember, Martha is doing what is right. The correct thing. She is doing what she is supposed to be doing, and she's upset. Because Jesus doesn't correct Mary, but corrects her. Sit with that for a moment because this bothers us when this happens. We would we would call that not fair, right? And and my kids will tell you what a fair is. It's a place you ride rides and eat funnel cake. That's kind of what I say in my house. Right? Because life's not fair. (laughs) But to put it in 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 our context of, of today, right? I've done all what I, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Why are they getting the raise? I, I do, I show up early, I stay late. Why are they getting the promotion? I, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Why, are, why, Jesus, aren't you telling Mary to get up and to help me? There can be frightening potential for us as followers of Jesus. For us to do things in our life for Jesus and miss doing things 
with Jesus. There's a potential for us to be so busy in what we do, even in the name of Jesus, that we actually miss Jesus. Because if I'm honest, I'm a lot more Martha than I am Mary. I, I, I tell people this, man, you give me a list of things to do and I will bust my tail to get that list done as quick as possible. Right? I, I'm a doer. I, I, I'm a, I'm a check, check that thing off. Right? And, and, and look, put yourself in Martha's shoes there for a minute, right? Like, she's making all the preparations that have to be done. Right? She's got people coming to her house. The guest of honor is God. Think about that for a minute, right? What would you do if the guest that was coming to your house for lunch today was God? Literally, like, literally. Like, you, you probably would skip church, right? <laughs> like, let's just be honest, right? I probably would skip church because, like, God's coming to my house for lunch, right? And I'd be busy with all the distractions, Full day of cleaning and, and prepping the house. This is where Martha is. Think about, think about this. And at some point, I'm sure she goes, where is that, Mary? Why isn't she in here helping me? And she starts like dropping the pans on the ground and make a lot of noise in the kitchen, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Making all the, the, the racket so everybody knows that she's in there by herself. She's had enough. She, you know, that's it. She throws down her wooden spoon, right? <laughs> Some of y'all know a wooden spoon. That's what my mommy should spank me with. That's how I know it's, it was in the kitchen. And she goes up, and what does she do? She goes right up to Mary and confronts her, right? Nope. <laughs> she goes to somebody else. So this is a freebie. Right? This isn't even part of the message. If you got a problem with somebody, go to them, not somebody else. Right? She goes to Jesus and she says, Don't you care? Which is quite ironic in that moment, right? Because we're talking about the guy that has been out feeding people and healing people in just uh, in just a short time will actually die for Martha. <laughs> Don't you care, Jesus? That I'm doing everything. And how does Jesus respond? Right? How dare you speak to the Son of God that way? Blasphemous, right? That's no. He's, he just he offers her affection and endearment. Martha. Martha. You're doing a thing that, that's expected of you, but you're you're missing it. You're missing the main thing. And that's what he said in, in Luke 41. He said, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things. My, my fear is we have a church that is surrendered to Jesus, but deeply distracted. We have a bunch of saved souls, but a wasted life. We're trusted and, and we're surrendered, but we're paying attention to the things that really don't matter, that really aren't important. I, I, I laugh. Um, I, I'll be scrolling through social media and I'll, I'll look at some of these things that, that people post about other pastors and they're, you know, you shouldn't sing this in church and you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't read this and you shouldn't, and I'm just like... Who has time to worry about what someone else says? That they, they, they devote hours of their time to make a podcast of it or, or content for it when there's people in die, who are dying and going to hell and we're worried about this. Unimportant stuff. Theology is important, okay? Don't get me wrong in that. I, I mean, like you, I love it. But Jesus didn't want Martha's activity. He wanted her. And 
And he didn't rebuke her for working hard. He just told her, hey, look, you're distracted. You're worried about the wrong stuff. I think she had a busy heart. I think she was so busy just wanting to do good and wanting to, to do, and she was missing out on the one thing, the one thing that mattered. She could not get later, and that was time with Jesus. Now, let me, let me say this. I'll throw this in there. Um, this, whole, this whole message, this is not a license to be lazy, right? Y'all, y'all understand that. Right, yeah, like it's not it's not a license to just say, "How's your week been? Great. I haven't done anything all week." Right, um, because you don't eat if you if you're lazy. Right, that's what the Bible says. Um, and so, uh, but this is this is this is not to let the the hard work uh, get in the way of our walk with Jesus. Not to let the things Jesus was not rebuking work in this moment. He was rebuking the distractions. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said this. He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you know why you need rest? It's because you've been working, right? Look, work makes you weary, and, and work can make you burdened, yeah, right? Like, and so if we don't take a break from that and come to Jesus... Because Jesus will always say this, come to me before he says, go for me. Jesus will always say, come to me before he says, go for me. Always. And I think what Jesus might be saying in this moment, when he looks at Martha, what he might be saying is, hey, look, Martha, when I stop by for a meal, it's not really to eat. Yeah, I like food, right? But when I stop by for a meal, it's, it's for a lot more. Because look, if I want to feed myself, I can do it. He just proved it, right? right? I mean, he just fed 5,000 men and women and children, plus, 5,000 plus, and had 12 basketfuls left over. If he gets hungry, he can feed himself, right? And so what I think Jesus might be saying is when I come by for a meal, it's to see you. It's to be with you. It's to be, so we can be together, so so we can enjoy our community together. And, And I wonder if we miss the little sentence in the story in verse 42. It says, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. Because Martha was was missing what mattered most. And what Jesus says, I'm not going to take the most important thing, spending time with me. I'm not going to take that from Mary. I'm not going to rob her of that opportunity. And I think we make so many excuses in our life uh, for our lack of time that we spend with Jesus, right? Like we make so many excuses. And many times those excuses are often good things, right? They're often good things. And um, I don't, I, I put this message and, and structured this series in a way where this was kind of right in the middle of our message series because I don't want us to be so distracted with trying to get around the table that we actually miss being at the table. You understand that? I don't want us to be so distracted with everything we got to do to to make sure that we're we're trying to bring people around the table that we miss the people at the table, the people that are actually there. I read a book this summer um, in my summer reading. Uh, kind of, I, I usually take the summer and I read two or three books, and uh, and it's called Unreasonable Hospitality. And it's the story of Will Gudera, who owned, uh, who was the former owner of Eleven, 11 Madison Park in New York in New York City, and if you're thinking, hey, if I'm ever in New York City, I'd love to check this out, don't, okay? Uh, it ranks in the top, not because it's good, but because we probably can't afford it here, okay? I'm just saying. But it ranks in the top 50 restaurants in the world. It's a three-star Michelin restaurant, 
Um, and I was actually in New York City this summer, and I was like, hey, I, should, I just read this book. I'd love to go buy it. And then I, I looked it up, and this is what their, their uh, website says about their menu. And this was just me and, and Nolan. We were in New York. This is what it says. It says, uh, we offer three, three uh, menus. And they don't, even, they don't even put their menus online. It's just they offer three menus. And, and I didn't have to read any farther to get turned off after this one. But it said, all of which are 100% plant-based. So, like, I'm a... Mm-mm. <laughs> yeah, man. And, uh, but it says this, our main dining room tasting menu is nine to 10 courses for $365 a person. Traditionally lasting two and a half to three hours. Featured both plated and communal dishes. And then their second option is a five course menu for $285 per guest and features highlights from the full tasting menu lasting roughly two hours. Served in our lounge, we offer a bar tasting menu for $225 per guest that consists of four to five courses, commonly lasting one and a half to two hours. Swanky, right? Well, he talks about in his book, uh, there was this time where these foodies were in New York City and they were going around just visiting all these Michelin star restaurants uh, and just enjoying the cuisine and enjoying the hospitality and all the other stuff. And he talks about he's at the table and he's talking with these people and this was their last stop on their trip. Uh, he knew that because they came in with their their uh, suitcases to leave, to go to LaGuardia or JFK after and fly back to home. And as he was talking with them, he was talking about their trip and where they've been and all this other stuff. And he asked them, or, or they say, the only regret we have is we didn't visit a street vendor and get a hot dog. If you've ever been in New York City and you've gotten anything on the street, you know it's good but it also isn't good for you, all right? Uh, and it's not plant-based either. And so, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but so he heard this, and immediately he goes out to the street, finds the first vendor, and buys a $2 hot dog. And he walks back into his swanky Soho restaurant and says to his chef, Prepare this four ways. And he talks about this taught him three lessons about hospitality. The first lesson was this, is to be present. Be present. We are moving so fast in this world, right? And he talks about, if I would not have been present in that moment, listening to what these people were talking about, I could have, my mind could have been a hundred different places, right? I mean, this is the owner of this restaurant. A hundred different places trying to figure out what they're going to do over here, but he's listening to them. And he, and he has this idea, they need a hot dog. They just, they just need a hot dog. So, so be present. Number two. Don't take yourself too serious. Don't take yourself too seri- serious. I, I don't know if you've ever been into a restaurant quite, I've never been into a restaurant quite like that because if they say 365 a person, I'm like, nope, we're out, right? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe $35 a person, but like, I can handle that if it's a good, if it's a good steak. But, um, but like, uh, if there's one thing that's a no-no in a top 50 restaurant in the world, it's a hot dog. Right? It, like, I mean, let's face it. We don't even know what's in a hot dog and how they make it. Like, right? And so, like, but, but later on, these people said, this was the highlight of our trip. It's the highlight of our trip. So, so don't take yourself too serious. And then the last thing I, I, would, I would say that he learned in this, or he said that he learned in this, um, is one size fits one. We've, we've often heard one size fits all, right? That's not true. Maybe for a hat, but not, not like, not in life. Like nothing could have compared to that $2 hot dog that those people got. Not caviar, you know, not the most expensive bottle of champagne or wine that they could have gotten. Not, nothing, nothing could have compared to them. It was the highlight of their trip where they had more than likely spent 
thousands of dollars. Look, we can get so bogged down in the details of service that we actually miss being present to be hospitable to someone. We can miss it. We can miss it. So how, how, do, we, how do we do this? I'm going to give you two things real quick. How can we do this uh, to put ourselves in situations in our homes and around our tables uh, to not be so distracted? You're going to be like, these are the two most churchy answers you can get right here, right? Here we go. Ready? First thing you got to do every day, be with God. First thing you got to do every day, be with God. Look, I, I told, I know some of y'all, like I asked if you're morning people and like you stuck your tongue out at me, at me, like, because you like, right? Because you're just not, look, but listen, I'm telling you, your day will be different if you spend your morning with God. I promise you promise you. You don't, you don't need that extra 15 minutes of sleep. You may think you do, but you don't. All right. And I'm just going to tell you, maybe you should say, you should probably, if you set, if you have to set your alarm, your alarm goes off, you're like, Oh, I want to hit the snooze button, but God, you better supernaturally give me this extra 15 minutes of sleep as I spend time with you. You better give me this rest, right? He can do it. He can do it. So first thing every day, be with God. Most of us wake up Martha, but we need to make a commitment to be more like Mary, to be at the feet of Jesus and start with a prayer. Read some scripture and start with this prayer. God, what do you want to do through me today? God, what do you want to do in me today? So first thing every day, be with God's people. And the first thing, every, uh, uh, sorry, be with God. And I told you the next one. The first thing every week, be with God's people. Look, I'm telling you, there is something that happens. Our, your life is better when you come to church. And it's not to hear me, right? It's not to hear the band. That doesn't make your life better. Because there's really good preachers and there's really good music out there, right? You can get much better uh, preaching than you're getting right now. Just, just listen to a podcast, right? I mean, there's some really good, I, I listen to them. I got friends that are way better than me. I'm like, hey, can I just steal your message this week? And like, you just, you just want to show you, right? Like, that was really good. There, it, it's, it's not about, it's not about listening and doing, it's, it's about being together. You know, the reason why in the summer that we do uh, the brunch and munch, it's, it's not so you can come here and get sweets and treats and all that other stuff. That's, that's just a bonus. But the goal is to bring you here to have community, to join together, to, to, to talk to people, to have friends. The one thing I was talking with um, a, a friend of mine a couple weeks ago, we were at a conference, and uh, Pastor Adam Peterson, he came and spoke here earlier this year, uh, and we were talking about how uh, the things that keep us coming to church and the, the people that we find are most connected at church are where they come because they have friends. And they get to see and hang out with their friends. Because it changes your week, right? Because we're built for community. We are built for being together. We're broken and we're flawed, but we're better together. I promise you that. I promise you that. And so this morning, as the band comes, we're going to sing... I just want to challenge you. I want to challenge you in, uh, in being present. Being present around our tables, right? Whatever table that is, right? It, your table can look like anything. Look, your table, in, in a sense, could be the console of your car, right? But be present in that moment. Don't, here, here's a challenge for us. Let's not spend so much time with our noses in a device when we're, when we're around people we love. Right? And it's hard, right? Like we, we make a conscious effort at our house at least once. Uh, we try twice a week, but we're busy, just like y'all. Uh, but we try at least once a week to eat dinner around the table. Some weeks we get it really good. Some weeks we're not so good. And the one rule that my wife always says, hey, hey, no phones at the dinner table. And I'm over there going, oh, I better put mine up, right? 
But that, that's our challenge. Let's be present in the moment. Because we only get so much time of presence, right? So that's our challenge today. Let's be together. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that your scripture teaches us how to be with you. The importance of keeping the main thing the main thing, and that's you. Pray, God, that you just continue to move in our hearts. I pray you continue just to move in, in our lives. God, that you would keep us from getting distracted. You would keep us from seeing all the things that need to be done around us. So we don't miss you. Jesus, thank you for setting an example for us of spending time with the Father. God, we thank you. God, we love you. It's in your name.